Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to COVID-19 in Context. A uh, especially warm welcome to all those who are joining us for the first time. Uh, I expect we have a lot of first-time viewers uh, this afternoon, and I would like to welcome you to the course and invite you to join us for future talks. Uh, we're in week three of an eight-week course, and if you're interested in joining us for the rest of the series, uh, please uh, shoot me a quick email and let me know. I'm going to put my email address in the chat box that you can uh, contact me to get on our distribution list. I, I email everybody on Sunday evenings, inviting you to the talks for the week. So tonight we have a very special session in addition to the course. Uh, our, our, the title of our, our talk this afternoon is Social Justice Protest in the Time of COVID. And we have four excellent speakers lined up to talk to us this afternoon and then join us for a Q&A. And so to get started here, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host, Dr. Anand Rao. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us for this special session. Uh, this is one that Dr. Melling and I have been looking forward to for quite a while, and, and while we were able to put it together in fairly short order, um, this is, uh, I think, a very important contribution to the course this summer. Um, special thanks to the panelists for agreeing in such short notice to be part of this, and after hearing what they have prepared, I'm really excited about this discussion. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to the panelists in just a moment, and then following that, we're gonna have some time for some Q&A. So make sure that if you have any questions that you'd like us to pose to the panelists in the Q&A, to enter those in the chat box. Uh, and those will be going directly to Dr. Mellinger and myself, and then we'll be able to ask those of the panelists once we get to the Q&A portion of this session. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to our first speaker and one of the, the individuals that helped us organize this, Dr. Craig Basie, who's a professor of philosophy here at UMW. Dr. Basie. Okay, sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, the Dean asked me to join this supplemental session of UMW's COVID in Context course because it just seemed so important to acknowledge the reality that the outbreak of the pandemic and the outbreak of the most powerful anti-racist pro protests in 50 years are intersecting, even if they're just tangential to each other. I'm not gonna make a strong claim about their intersection. My comments are in the spirit of putting the social justice protest phenomenon in context. I think what I have to say about this may be a little different from what uh, you, you would expect because I'm not a social scientist, I'm a philosopher. Now, do you read the comics in the Washington Post, I wonder? I wanna show you one from the other day. Give you a couple minutes to take a look at that. You've probably already guessed that if you divide 20,852 weeks by 52, you get 401 years. It takes us back to 1619. The moral I take away from pondering this comic is this: that we're 15 years, we're 15 weeks. <clears throat> into a health crisis, into a crisis that threatens our health, and we're already tired of living it as a crisis. Of course, we want to get back to normal. What that means is that we begin to, ex we begin to accept the way things have come to be. People are going to restaurants again, despite the fact that infections are continuing to rise. It can be hard to keep seeing a crisis as a crisis. It can be fairly easy, at least for some, to begin to see a crisis situation as normal reality, especially if you still have your job, and if you don't have to take public transportation. And what is our stance on the crisis that has been going on for 20,853 weeks? The existential crisis of threatened survival for black people in a white dominated world. Obviously, most of us don't see that as a crisis at all. We see it as the way things are, that's reality. That's the story of life. When things have been a certain way for 20,800 weeks, there's not much expectation that they're going to change. They've become normal. What makes them normal, though, is they're being accepted, and that means being accepted by the people who control things. So what is remarkable is that an explosion has again taken place. After 50 years, more than 50 years after the riots of the 1960s and the killing of Martin Luther King, the United States is again experiencing a massive refusal of the way things are. And that massive refusal happens to coincide, quite tragically, with the COVID pandemic. It's interesting and very important as the national discussion progresses that people are now talking about racism itself as a public health issue. Certainly for one thing, because blacks are 13% of the population, but 25% of the mortalities from COVID-19. 
but more systematically also because anti-black racism has meant poorer health conditions and health care, living conditions, economic opportunity, and so on for centuries. And it's remarkable that that explosion, which is about the lives of black people, is not an explosion solely on the part of black people. White people are out in amazing numbers in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and Australia, defying the health risks posed by the COVID pandemic, denouncing what has been made normal for the last 20,853 weeks. Other non-white people from Syria to Korea are out in the streets also denouncing this normal world and exposing themselves too to the risk of COVID pandemic in their countries. Now you may be wondering why a 64 year old white man was asked to be in this special session on social justice protest in the time of COVID and the, B and the BLM protests. So I'd like to take a minute to say a few things about my background. 34 years ago, when I arrived at Mary Washington College, I was a 30 year old white man teaching about race and gender. And in 1986, I didn't have a lot of company. It's nice that things have changed. The Mary Washington College Board of Visitors in 1986 would never have published a resolution like the one that our board published last week. A colleague and I in 1988 got a grant from the Virginia State Government to run a program called Race and Gender Curriculum Transformation Project. And for six years, we ran seminars for faculty members where we provided opportunities to learn about current scholarship on race and racism and gender issues and discuss ways to incorporate this into our classes. I've been advocating for a black studies program ever since. And the one time I can remember Jim Farmer ever getting up and speaking at a faculty meeting was to say, this school is 20 years behind the times. It needs a black studies program. And that was back in 1990 or so. When Farmer was teaching here in the 90s, I brought him on stage together with William Kunstler, who had been King's law, uh, attorney during the civil rights movement in Dodd Auditorium. I brought Bell Hooks to campus for a, a faculty workshop. Benjamin Hooks came for a lecture, Angela Davis in 2012 for the first James Farmer lecture, and Charles Mills in 2014 for my course on social justice. And after Farmer's passing in 1999, I was on the committee that created the James Farmer Postdoctoral Fellowship in Social Justice, which we ran for nearly 10 years. And I led an interdisciplinary group of faculty to create a first year seminar called Race and Revolution, which has been teaching our entering students about Farmer and about other civil rights leaders from Du Bois to Ella Baker for 10 years now. There's a display case in Trinkle Hall that I installed a few years ago that explains that it was Governor E. Lee Trinkle who signed the Racial Integrity Act into law in 1924. This is the law that was overturned by the Supreme Court in 1970 in the Loving versus Virginia case. UMW has been talking about renaming the building since about a year ago. So why? Because decades ago, my philosophical studies led me to realize that the concepts of race and gender are surprisingly problematic. They're much more complex than we generally think. And yet they are governing our way of living our everyday lives and our way of thinking about the world and each other, our way of thinking about who we are. So I wanna primarily focus this brief talk today on the myth of race, and I hope you will be able to see its relevance to understanding our current situation. What do we think race is? That is, what do we think this word race means? As philosophers point out, most people don't ask themselves questions like this very often. They just take for granted the concepts and the common sense of their society, and they go about their business. When I told someone last week that this was gonna be my topic, his response was, I've never thought about that. I've never thought about what that word means. Well, here, it's very useful to know something about this word. It's only a few hundred years old. The earliest occurrences of it in Western civilization are in Portuguese from the 1600s, Haza. It's important to realize it is not an ancient concept. The Greeks did not have this concept. The Romans and the Hebrews did not have this concept. And that means it has not been a universal concept. <clears throat> it has not been a concept essential to understanding human existence. Why can I assert this? Because it is very clearly a science, a scientific concept. It's a concept that arises from a scientific attitude, from an attitude that is asking for naturalistic explanations of why it is that there are people of different colors and what that fact means. It's a concept from what we know as the age of enlightenment. Before, the sci before that age of science, human differences were understood in terms of religion, culture, climate, and geography. But with the rise of world exploration and conquest and the slave trade, 
In the beginning of the scientific re revolution, a new question arose for Europeans, which is, why is it acceptable for Christians to treat some people as though they were not people? The Spanish were doing this in the Southwest with, the, with their requerimiento as early as 1513, requiring natives to convert to Christianity and acknowledge the authority of the king and the pope or else be killed in a language that they did not speak or understand, while the Portuguese were running the slave trade. But the 16th century answer was that these people were uncivilized, they were savage, they were not Christian, and so it was appropriate to subjugate them. By the 18th century, it became more clear that a more rational justification for the treatment of some humans as subhumans was needed. And the concept of race was basically invented to provide this. Unfortunately, and ironically, the great German moral philosopher Immanuel Kant had a significant role to play in crafting this concept, and so did Thomas Jefferson, of course. Before this time, human differences were understood in terms of culture and climate. Now they began to be understood in terms of biology, in terms of biological features and supposedly apparent natural facts. But of course, there was no well-established science of biology at the time, not in the sense in which we take it for granted today. In fact, the biological understanding of human differences in the 18th and 19th century was simply to a degree what we would today call pseudoscience. There were theories, there were efforts made to understand human differences in terms of natural facts, but they were so guided and so shaped by the social and political agenda of the time that they now show themselves to be nothing but obvious falsehoods. Like asking astrology to explain astronomical uh, answers to provide answers for astronomical questions. I mean, can you imagine taking seriously the idea of royal blood versus common blood? Centuries of civilization took this deadly seriously. Or taking seriously the idea of black blood versus white blood. Again, several centuries of civilization have taken this deadly seriously. We now know this to be absurd. In the 20th century, the effort to find biological explanations of difference shifted into the fields of genetics and DNA. And we now know from that work that there are no genetic markers or differences between people of different so-called races. There is as much genetic difference between two members of the same so-called race as there is between members of different so-called races. An excellent video on this topic is Race, Power of an Illusion, which I'll put on my list of resources at the end. The point is the idea of races is the idea that human beings are somehow stamped from the beginning divided into natural kinds, as though they were different species and their differences in culture or morality or intellect or sensitivity or talent was due to their biological makeup. This way of thinking in terms of natural differences is a scientific way of thinking. The idea of race emerged from a specifically scientific project to understand human differences and to explain the inferiority of some people. And it cemented into place the belief that there is a biological explanation even though science in the late 20th century has proven this to be quite false. But this has created a real problem for us. We have inherited a word for describing human beings that comes to us from an unapologetically racist period of our, of our history that conveys the claim that human differences are grounded in biology, not culture. And although this claim is false, we have no other word for talking about human differences. To put it somewhat paradoxically, the concept of race is a racist concept. It's a pseudo-scientific concept in the service of racism. I wanna share a list of resources and I'll put that up on the screen before I move on and finish up my talk. That's not the one I want, sorry. There it is. By talking about ourselves in, term, in the language of race, we perpetuate what the concept of race was invented to accomplish. We construe human differences in terms of built-in biologically caused capacities so they can be ranked as superior and inferior. The word invites us to believe in the old one drop rule that people believed in explicitly during the early 20th century when Virginia passed the Racial Integrity Act. The rule that if you have any ancestor who's not white, then you're not white. That's why they invented those other words like mulatto and quadroon and octoroon. But even today, everyone says Colin Powell is black. Even though he had a white Irish mother, everybody says Obama is black. These guys are just as white as they are black. One parent from each of the two races. 
but no one identifies them as white or even half white because the logic of the biological concept of race controls their thinking. We still say we're black or that we're white. Many of us sense that these words are something like metaphors because brown and non-white are terms that have becoming, been coming into use fairly recently. But how many white people do you know are really white the way that this piece of paper is white? And how many black people do you know who are really black the way that this shirt is black? It's more like we're 50 shades of brown. To get away from the concept of race, we do better to talk about being tan or peach or mocha or ebony or beige or chestnut or khaki and so on. Then we would know we were only talking about skin color and not about something that people thought skin color was a sign of. It simplifies things to say black and white, but the price of the simplification is the distortion of the truth and the misunderstanding of reality. Now, what do these philosophical points have to do with us today and with Black Lives Matter and with social justice protests? I think the answer is everything because the very need to say Black Lives Matters tells us that we still live in a world where people still believe that the color of your skin means you are a certain kind of person rather than another and that the different kinds of people are of greater and lesser value. But we're all persons. Persons with different skin, different hair, different eyes, different hands, different feet, and so on, but we still live in a world that has not corrected certain specific mistakes of previous centuries yet. That has not explicitly repudiated the myth that people of different skin colors are different in some deep down sense, having to do with competence, capacity, talent, or importance. This is a foundational myth of our society. And it's very much alive today, just as it was in the days of the founders like Jefferson. This social justice protest movement is ultimately, I think, a movement against that foundational myth, against racism, and therefore a movement against what the very idea of race makes us believe. That's why it's so important to tear down monuments to our racist past, to discredit our allegiance to a world that tolerates seeing ourselves through the biological concept of race, and therefore sees racism itself as though it was somehow natural or just the way things are. And we're seeing some transformations along these lines that I barely even hoped we'd ever see. In saying that the concept of race is a concept from biology and that it's a myth, I am not denying the reality of race. But we need to shift very dramatically in how we understand re that reality. Race is not a biological reality. It is, however, a social reality and a historical reality, though it's one that's only a few hundred years old. The fact that we inherit our race from our parents does not mean that race is a biological reality. We can inherit money from our parents. We can inherit a guitar from our parents. We can inherit our political beliefs from our parents. They're not biological. <clears throat> Ibram Ken Kendi, a historian at American University, recent pu recently published a, a new book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. Now that's a very important element of this fight. Our foot, we have to get on a footing of anti-racism. We have to admit that our society is racist, our traditions are racist, our education is racist, and that our background understanding of human beings is even racist. Kendi claims that there's no point in trying to be neutral or non-racist. Have you ever heard anybody say they don't have a racist bone in their body? Because everything in our world is complicit with our world being a racist world. None of us is a non-racist. It's impossible to not be racist when you've lived in a world and been raised in a world that is now 20,853 weeks into the reproduction and maintenance of white supremacy. I hope you will look into Charles Mills's book, The Racial Contract, which provides a devastating account of this. The stance to pursue is how to be a non-racist. So I think that may be all I should say today till we get to the Q&A. Let me now introduce my friend, Gay Adegbalola. Gay was born here in Fredericksburg when it was a segregated town, and she graduated from Walker Grant High School, the black school. She participated in civil rights protest in, in uh, Fredericksburg, in downtown Fredericksburg in the 1960s. And in fact, you can see her photo from the time in, on the marker in, uh, at Caroline and William Street, which was outside, uh, outside of what was then Woolworths. In 1984, she co-founded Sapphire, the uppity, uppity blues women, which became her full-time job within a few years. Sapphire played together for 25 years and achieved national and international following, releasing numerous CDs and winning the WC Handy Award. 
Gay is a remarkable songwriter and performer, a social justice activist for five decades, and always a teacher. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce her this afternoon. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Gay Todd Adegbalola. And I say Todd because both my mom and my dad were activists here in Fredericksburg. They are both on the wall of honor down in the uh, city, uh, city hall, if you should go down there and look around. So I'm proud to have been uh, born, raised, and still live here in Fredericksburg. I have used a black name since 1968. And to this day, a lot of doctors, uh, and I'm talking about doctors in the college, and a lot of students at the college who can read still won't say my name because it's like they got something against learning and saying a black name. I have uh, uh, kept my hair natural since 68. See, I got woke in 68 by Malcolm X. And I've kept black music alive as best I can. I play the blues and I sing the blues. Uh, this particular lick. For guitar players, it's in open G. And it's a riff from Sun House. This song I basically wrote in 1999. I added some new lyrics in uh, 2017. And I just added some more new lyrics a week ago. Sit-ins and picket lines for civil rights. Uh, dogs in water, hoses, crosses burning in the night. Was down in Mississippi that Emmett Till was lynched. Then down in Texas, James Bird was dragged and ditched. James Bird, James Bird, a righteous name I know. Just change your James to Jim, and the bird is still a pro. James, James, nothing has changed. James, James, nothing has changed. Washed and learned all the white folks' clothes. Nurse their babies, now she works in nursing homes. And to be twice as good, to get half a chance, you're still fired first than a higher best. They talk about a glass ceiling, now don't you know? She's down on her knees on a concrete floor. Change, change, and nothing has changed. Change, change, and nothing has changed. against the landlord at home or abroad. Nothing's really changed uh, for what it's worth. They got you coming, got you glowing. It's all based on greed. You rent to own in the interest they can bleed. Used to buy from old Masa at the company store. Now call it MasterCard. It keeps the people poor. Change, change. Oh, nothing has changed. Change, change. Nothing has changed. KKK and the Nazis march in Charlottesville. Spearing hate, kind guns, warning blood to spill. They're saluting Hitler and their president. They wave their rebel flags like the war ain't over yet. Oh, some who stand against them for democracy, that's true. Star spangled love in the red, white, blue. Change, change, nothing has changed. Change, change, nothing has changed. This is the new part. Trump body tear gas with every step he took. No love, no compassion, desecrate our holy book. Young people of all colors, from all countries and all creeds, fight against oppressors, amputate them at their knees. Yeah, they stand against the hate. 
hatred. They stand against the greed. They stand against the injustice. They stand and take the lead. They stand against the violence. When blood begins to splatter, they stand. They stand because Black Lives Matter. Change, change. Something has changed. Change, change. Uh, has it hasn't really changed. I need to say that again. Change, change. Something has changed. Change, change. But has it really changed? How can I be angry? There's been some changes true. Too slowly in my lifetime. There's much more we can do. Anytime a child is hungry, anytime there's homeless men, anytime there is no doctor and there is no medicine, anytime there's ethnic cleansing, anytime there's genocide, anytime there's been a hate crime and freedom's been denied, anytime there's been a war and religious persecution, a shepherd or a train bomb, another fatal shooting, anytime there's been a ghetto, anytime a reservation, anytime we meet a place to pay. With discrimination, how can I be angry? There's been some changes true. Too slowly in my life, and there's much more we can do. Gotta make a change. Gotta make a change. Gotta make a change. Gotta make a change. Yeah, you heard it first. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I got real dry. I got so dry I could hardly get the words out. Give me a minute here. Old ass gay is on medication and medication drives you out. I want to say to the young people in particular that I'm so sorry I can't be there with you. I can't be there with you because number one, I'm old. Number two, I'm black. Number three, I had a respiratory problem. And number four, there is still a pandemic. So this talk right here is about the intersection of protests, one pandemic, and another pandemic. So this is why gay is not on the front lines. But believe me, I want to be there. And most of my colleagues do too. You see, with this protest, as with most protests, whether you're looking at Mandela or whether you're looking at Martin Luther King or whether you're looking at Dr. James Farmer, it all starts with a degree of fearlessness. So these young people who are out here on the front lines, they're out here because they don't fear a medical pandemic. They have the courage to work against a systemic racist pandemic that is in this country here and now. And what we don't have is a national leader like we had in Dr. King or like South Africa had in Mandela or like the country had in Obama. No, he would not lead a protest, but certainly he would lead sanity. And so, you know, I see these young folks and I, I get kind of upset because half of them don't have on masks and I'm like, when they yell or chant, well, the next line coming behind them is walking right into their saliva, you know? And I kind of worry about that. And I worry when they use the same microphone and the same megaphone. Yeah, I do. But I guess they just say, we got a bigger fight to fight. And if I should die, what the hell? I'm dying already for no good cause. And so I can look at other aspects of the pandemic because this is what this class is about. And the next one I thought about right away was the fact that George Floyd was positive for COVID-19. He was uh, tested positive in April. Now, an interesting fact is that George Floyd and Derek Chauvin, his murderer, both worked at the same place. Both of them were bouncers. And it's my understanding that Derek didn't particularly like George. So, hmm, this just might be murder one. Think about that, if you will. When we talk about the pandemic and the time before and their interactions 
Maybe the protests and pandemics is intersecting again. But what I really wanted to bring to light, because there's too much to talk about in such a short time. When I gave that little song just now, that song was a history lesson from my start with the protest. The emphasis I want to put is on the second verse, washed and earned the white folks clothes, nurse their babies, now she works in nursing homes. This little street that I grew up on, when I was coming up here, every woman on the street was a washerwoman who washed and ironed white folks clothes except my mom was a school teacher and Miss Silver taught her kindergarten. Every other woman on the block was a washerwoman who washed and ironed white folks' clothes. Now, the generation right before them, my grandmothers, my Aunt Lena was like my grandmother, her generation, they nursed their babies. So now look at here, nurse their babies, wash their clothes, my generation, and where is my generation and this one after? They're in nursing homes. Nursing homes, think about this, we're talking about the pandemic. I'm gonna bring the two things together now. These protests, the reason why they are so different is because for once, white folks believe us. For the first time, it was vicious enough and nasty enough, and you were present enough, thanks to Darnella Frazier, a 70-year-old Black girl who would not move and videoed the whole thing. But now you can believe us. We've been saying it for, as Craig pointed it out, 401 years we've been saying it. Now, Black men have always been emasculated but on the lowest rung of that racial totem pole is black women. You see, my mama was high yellow because she was from Massapont, her people, one farm away from Quinta Quinte's farm. And every other person in her mother's family was, as we say, light skinned. My mama's people were raped. That's why I didn't want to say Bob. I didn't want the slave block in downtown, but what did it take to get you white folks to believe that we didn't want the slave block? Well, what it took was simply one of these young people spray painting fuck on the side of it. If I'd have known that, I, it could have saved me three years of trouble, <laughs> three years of meetings. All right, so back to these, to these women, they're basically women who work as certified nursing assistants in nursing homes. Where is the biggest outbreak? Where is it rampant COVID-19? Nursing homes. Who, I ask you, who's changing, excuse my language, but the shitty sheets? These women. Who is paid the least of any person, less than a garbage man, less than a school teacher, CNAs, and they have to take these jobs because they have to take care of their children. And guess what? There is no child care center. So you think they got something to protest? You think their families got something to protest? You think their teenage kids got something to protest? And hell yeah, if you want to burn down a store and take a pair of Nike shoes, maybe they feel they deserve a pair of Nike shoes too. Now, don't go writing in your little questions and say, oh, you support, you support burning down places. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying that the, that the pain, the pandemic of racism is not just with police brutality. It's also an injustice on so many fronts. And I'm just highlighting one aspect. I'm highlighting the nursing homes. And then on top of that, folks who are listening in, some of you probably have people in the nursing homes. On top of that, a lot of the people in the nursing homes are good old girls and good old boys. 
And how do you think they treat young black CNAs? So I guess I've said a mouthful about that. I guess I've used up my 10 minutes. Uh, all I'm saying is that we're only three generations removed from nursing their babies. And we still work in nursing homes for next to no pay and get treated terribly. So if y'all got somebody in the nursing home and you know a CNA that's been kind, it won't hurt if you go up and shake their hands and put a $20 bill in their hands and say, thank you. Now they're not supposed to take money, but then again, we're not supposed to holler when we've stepped on either. Amen, amen again. Ah, I am doing a show, a free show on Saturday night at eight o'clock on Facebook. Of course you can too, but it's a free show for Juneteenth and it's hard blues for hard times. Those songs that you heard at the beginning, that one, if it had been a dog, I wrote it in 1992 after Rodney King was beat again and again and again. Yeah, if it had been a dog, Ellen would have take, uh, taken up all kinds of money. Yeah. So um, let us just take the goodness that comes from George Floyd's murder. Let us take the goodness and let us face racism on as many fronts as we can. I'm so thankful that marches are happening all over the world. Amen and amen again. And I thank you for this opportunity to speak to your classroom. Ms. Gaya Degbalola, thank you so much for being here. Powerful message, uh, wonderful performance. We were getting tons of messages from the attendees that were really enjoying the performance and sending you positive messages and how much they appreciate you and everything you've been doing. Thank you for that. And thank you for letting us play some of your music before the show today. We really enjoyed that. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, wanted to give everybody a reminder that uh, we have two more presenters and then we will open it up for a Q&A. And if you have questions for that Q&A that you would like Dr. Mellinger and I to ask of the presenters, please enter them in the chat box. Uh, if you look at your Zoom webinar window at the bottom, there should be a button that says chat. You can open up the chat box, you can enter questions there and we'll be able to take as many of those as we can fit into that half hour Q&A. Um, next, it's my pleasure to turn it over to the next presenter. Uh, and I think that presenter will then introduce our final presenter after that. So it's a pleasure to uh, introduce somebody that I've had a chance to know and work with quite a bit over the last few years. Uh, and I hear such wonderful things from our students about and members of the community. Uh, the next presenter is Mr. Justin Wilkes, who is director of our Students in Transition program. Justin, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to share my screen. Um, first of all, greetings to everyone um, who's participating in this, this webinar today. Um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to speak to you all um, and to share a little bit of my experience and, and how I feel right now. Um, and as I was putting together my thoughts and what I wanted to share with you all today in my time, um, the first thing that continued to come to mind was a, a book that I read. Um, I read two times now, um, but it was published by Mr. Walter Dean. Um, it's called Monster and it came out in 2001. And it was written in the form of a screenplay through the lens of the main character who was a 16 year old boy on trial for murder because he served as a lookout for a robbery that turned into a homicide. And the title comes from a point in the book where during her opening statement, the prosecuting attorney refers to the boy on trial as a monster. Um, and so I, I looked up the definition of um, monster in Webster's dictionary and I'll read to you what it says. Um, it says monster is an imaginary creature that is typically large, ugly and frightening, having features of both human and animal. And so going back to, to the text, um, Dean Myers was asked in an interview, um, you know, how he came about naming the book. Um, and he shared um, that as he was writing the story, he, he actually took the story from a, a real trial that he experienced to serve witness to. But he, he stated, the easiest way to erase the value of a person is to dehumanize them, to characteristically, characteristically separate them from any qualities that deem them worthy of the same respect and fairness as their counterparts. And so I, I take this and I share this with you all because I feel like in our current day and present time, what we are experiencing is over 400 years of the systematic dehumanizing of a certain subset of people. And the weapon of choice um, has been race. And just as um, Dr. Vasey spoke about earlier and, and Gay, um, race has been 
to me, the weapon that has that has created the hierarchy in the system that, that we currently experience and are troubled by. I mean, I say that because I feel like race is a, it's a prescribed single feature that has aided in many ways the homogeneous characterizing and systematic reducing of black people. And the result of that has been a lopsided history that has continually impacted people's opinion of who we are, which in turn has affected how people have instinctually responded to blacks. And I, in the picture that I decided to put on this particular slide was that of Amy Cooper, because I think, you know, this is a very recent story. And I think it's a very clear portrayal of how she knew that she could web how to weaponize race in her particular instance by when she called the police stating that she was being harassed by a black man, um, she knew what that meant and she knew what the response could very well be. Um, so, uh, so again, that weapon of dehuman dehumanization has been race um, since the beginning of the America, if we want to be honest. And for every good scary movie, there always has to be a special name that's associated uh, with the enemy to cultivate fear. And for blacks, um, our names have, you know, continue to, uh, the names have changed over time, but they've had the same meaning from colored to being called niggers, super predator and thug. And so, um, again, going back into that characterization of, of monster, um, that we've always been dehumanized to, to be different. And we also know that because monsters are scary, that has given society the right to police us differently, um, in my opinion. And so, I, I can remember the first time that I felt like a monster, and I'm gonna briefly share this story. Um, and it, it's a bit hard for me because I've never shared this story in a public setting. I've also never shared this story with many people who know me. Um, but I've always known I was black and, and growing up in a small rural town in central Virginia, it, it was very clear to me that there were different rules that I was supposed to play by. Um, but I remember my senior year, well, I just graduated from high school, 18 years old, had been accepted to college um, on scholarship, never been in trouble, a three sport athlete, um, did everything right. I felt during, during my time, my parents, you know, raised me to be a respectful and upright young man. But I remember this particular night, um, it was myself and four friends. We were coming back from Bedford, Virginia, um, visiting some other friends and it was close to midnight. And I was sitting in the passenger side, my, my best friend was driving his mother's brand new car. At the time it was a Toyota Camry, brand new car, and three other friends sitting in the back, all of whom were black. And we remember, you know, I recall he wasn't speeding, and, but we recall a car getting behind us and following us for what felt like two or three miles. And every time he would slow down more to hopefully let the car go by because it was a, it was a four lane road, the car would stay behind us and eventually the car you know, put on high beams, almost as, you know, blinding us. And after another couple of miles, uh, we saw the blue lights. And so we pulled over, or my friend pulled over. And I recall when the cop finally came to the car, he didn't ask for license and registration. He immediately made my friend get out of the car, out of the driver's side. And us being 18, not knowing our rights at the time, scared, we didn't know what to do. But I remember three or four other officers, I remember one in particular was standing by my door with his hand on his gun um, and two officers standing at the back of the car while this fifth officer went and, and pretty much interrogated my friend, told him, and I, we could hear the discussion. And, and because I was trained as a child, I knew to keep my hands on the dashboard um, and not to make any sudden movements. But I remember this cop standing beside me with his hand on his gun and we could hear the officer tell my friend that I pulled you over because this car was reported as stolen. Um, and you know, the record shows that it, uh, that it belongs to uh, a white male with um, blue eyes and blonde hair. And I, I recall the, the interaction between my, my friend and the officer and it was a, a back and forth. But again, the officer never asked for papers, never asked for records. Eventually they let us go. But in that moment, it, it showed me that it showed me my place in, in terms of at any given moment in time, things could very well go wrong. And we, we went through the proper steps of filing a police report. Um, my parents raised hell and nothing became of that incident. Um, and so I say that I shared that story because when I look at stories like Trayvon Martin, 
um, for Philander Cash Castillo and George Floyd, it always makes me relive that moment and how I feel like I could have been one of them. And so what we're seeing right now in, in America is that, in my opinion, the mood is we, we feel like hamsters on a wheel, that the harder we cry, the complain, we beg for change, it sounds like we're shouting in a windstorm. And so I want you all to understand these emotions that you're seeing presented on Facebook and Instagram and the news. Um, it's real. And so there are some acts that we have of you, um, in particular today. My biggest worry, you know, and I, I encourage and push, you know, that we continue to protest, we continue to fight for equal rights. But my worry is that when the next story becomes a story, that once again, this situation and circumstance will be um, yesterday's news. And so I ask that when the revolution is not no longer televised, that we, and when I say we, all of us, black, white, brown, no matter what you consider yourself to be, that we continue to, to, to raise the fight for anti-racism. Um, and so there are a few things that I wanna share with you, um, and again, as my ask, and I can't take credit for these. I actually um, pulled these from a young lady by the name of Sophie Williams. She's an artist and an author, um, and she's actually the founder of a outlet called Millennial Black. And she has a book coming out at the latter part of this year, um, early 21. Um, but she wrote about um, some different ways that we all can continue to push for anti-racism um, and keep the momentum going after you know the the protest and maybe the movement settle down so these are things that i ask of you and the first is don't tone police um, right now uh, I, and I, I share that because a lot of people uh, in conversations and just kind of ear hustling and hear different people talk um, about what they're seeing on the news etc a lot of people have different feelings and, and ways they feel people should protest and riot and loot and, and so forth and so on. And so I ask that if you don't understand, we, we are entitled to our feelings and who and how people express those feelings in whatever way they choose to. And so I, I ask that you please allow us to feel the full range of our feelings and until we are done and not till not when people feel like we should be done. Um, so that is my first guess. The second is I encourage everyone to educate themselves. Um, it is my feel, and when I talk to friends and others, it is my feel that we would love to talk to you about how we're feeling and about you know, our perception of history and the things we've gone through and what we continue to go through, but we don't feel like it's our job to educate because you have the same access to Google um, and, and a lot of resources that are available. So we do encourage you, please educate yourself. Um, and in educating yourself, you know, check with us to see if talking is okay. And, and uh, I'm one, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much an open book and very willing to sit down and have those conversations. But it's challenging. It's challenging. And so I don't want to be a teacher. And, I, and again, I, I'm not speaking for, for the masses. I'm speaking for myself and others I've spoken to. We encourage you to educate yourself and then we can talk, but we don't want to teach. And lastly, um, here's a list of things that we encourage people to do. Um, buying from black businesses. I'm gonna to touch on that particular one last. Um, bias training, there, there's so many resources that are available. Um, one, one of the biggest things I ask of people is to be honest um, and be sincere in your efforts, whether you're protesting um, and you're non-black. We do ask, I do ask that people be sincere because I've seen a lot of things that, you know, I, I laugh at, but, it, they're not funny and I call them people doing too much. Um, in particular, it's not okay to wear chains and shackles and, um, and represent you know, slavery in your own man manner to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is enough. Um, but also doing the work in terms of educating yourself and us having the conversations and it's working to be better people. That, that's what we, we desire, um, not, not the, you know, sometimes the extra semantics. I'm talk, talking to your kids and talking to your parents. That's one thing I can say as a parent, I am very strategic and, and honest with talking to my daughter about who she is as a person, but also talking to her about other identities um, and other affinities. Um, and one, one example in particular is we often have read a book um, that she loves called Jacob's Dress. And it's about a young boy who um, desires to wear a dress to school in that process. And so I encourage you all, even if you feel like you don't understand, educate yourself and talk to your kids, talk to parents, talk to people around you. That's the best way you can advocate is to not let the topics die. 
to continue to push for um, push for people to have a better understanding um, so that hopefully that will create the change. Um, donating, don't, donating to the different organizations that are working to um, you know, fight for mass incarceration and, and other ways in which people have been marginalized. So continue to look for resources and ways that you can donate and get into the fight. You may not be a protester, but it's great to have you um, don donating or participating in other ways. I mean, I myself, I'm, I'm lucky to be at a point in my life to where I, whereas I can now donate and I can give back and I can participate in other ways. Um, but the last point, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cam, that I, that I wanted to stress, um, buying from Black businesses. And, and I, I do want to stress this particular point because I heard a young lady on, um, she was doing a talk recently, and I, I don't remember what the talk was for, what, what her name was. But she so eloquently um, broke down the history of America into the game of Monopoly, um, particularly for, for Blacks in America. And the way she broke it down was in 400 years, we, we've been allowed to play the game, but we were never allowed to earn the money, to own anything on the board. And while playing the game, we were making our white counterparts wealthy. And so in the next 50 years, we were allowed to play the game, but every time we started winning, our white counterparts required us to either turn over the majority of our earnings or they would knock the game off the table um, and make us start over if we were starting to win. And there's instances such as Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, and Savannah, Georgia, places where black enterprise was freestanding and booming um, in the early 1900s. And the last example she gave, gave was as we continue to play the game, when our white counterparts feel like we may be gaining on them, the rules are often changed or were cheated. And, Examples of that, redlining, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, 80s crack, crack epidemic. So I say all that to say in order to reduce racism and to, to re increase inequality in our America, that there has to be in black enterprise and communities being built up so that we can have a fair share, fair share and, and voice in, in what America looks like and how America moves forward. Uh, so. Um, that is what I wanted to share with you all today. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Hopefully I can, I look forward to answering some of your questions. Um, but right now I'm going to turn it over to Cameron Coates, who is a U of W 2020 graduate um, from the Department of Communication and Digital Studies. And also I had the great pleasure of working with Cam as he was a member of the STP program. How's it going, everybody? Uh, Justin said it. I'm, my name is Cameron Coates. Everybody calls me Cam. I'm a recent graduate of UMW with a uh, bachelor's degree in communications and digital studies and also a former STP student. Um, and I've been in the front lines with the protest in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, my specific group is called the Melanin Cooperative and we work with other groups such as AAC, which is um, Activists, Allies and Change, uh, Leaders for Peace, and the Fredericksburg Power Collective. I feel like I'm forgetting one more team, but we're all together. We've come together as a group of uh, young um, people and we've been leading marches as well as uh, or other um, events that help the community but most importantly the black community in Fredericksburg. Um, so I just wanted to give my accounts of what I've been seeing on the front lines um, and it takes me back all the way to two Sundays ago I believe it was May 31st or three Sundays ago um, when if some of you already know there were um, protests happening um, in the city and the beginning that the first half of the protest ended with uh, people who were peaceful protesters becoming or being uh, tear gassed and shot with rubber bullets uh, on Cowan Boulevard right in front of the police precinct. Um, and there's footage that's been shared around on all sorts of social media. I've, I'm one of them that has shared that. And I was not a part of that uh, march because I was at work that day. But Come 10 o'clock at night, same night, um, I come out from where I was working and I see a line of uh, police in riot gear uh, up off of uh, Hanover Street right next to uh, City Hall in the courthouse. And there was about six individuals, including myself, that were on the sidewalk kind of asking the you know, police officers like what was going on. A lot of us, some of us were like really clueless as to what was happening. Um, but unfortunately, we were met with tear gas and rubber bullets, even though we were not on the road, as they asked, and we were 
um, you know, on the sidewalk being peaceful. And then uh, another wave of protesters came and that's when uh, footage has been shown of tear gas or bullets, even concussion grenades were used in order to scare us off and you know, keep us from uh, exercising our First Amendment rights of protesting. And so since then, I've been involved with a number of young uh, leaders who inspire me every day uh, to come out and march through the streets and get people aware in Fredericksburg that they need to do something, that they need to join us, you know, help with the resources, donating, and just educating themselves on the situation rather than kind of batting a blind eye, which I think a lot of people are starting to do now um, within the city, which is awesome, honestly. That's, you know, that's the, the point of the protest is to bring awareness and just also be able to um, voice our, you know, our emotions and, um, you know, of the situation. Uh, and so we started out, I started with joining the marches on Tuesday and somehow jumped up at, into a, a leadership position. And from there, we just kind of kept expanding and kept meeting with other groups and created sort of the, the coalition that we have now. Um, for us, we, we want to, uh, we have demands that have been distributed by the French Human Power Collective, who we are in collaboration with. And our demands are, we believe are pretty simple. I, I think two of the seven are already um, solved, but uh, I might be mistaken, but I have the demands listed and I would like to read them out. Um, so the first one is publicly condemning the harmful actions and exercises of force, excessive force that the Fredericksburg police and Stafford police deployed in response to recent peaceful protests. We're still waiting on that uh, formal apology. Uh, me and one of the other leaders actually took, uh, talked to the mayor of Fredericksburg about um, setting something up like that. And she's you know, trying her best during this time to try to get that uh, situated. The second one was lift the curfew that allows for the unjust detainment of citizens attempting to exercise their legal right to assemble. That has already been solved. The only issue that we are having with this is that 50 plus people were charged with um, misdemeanor, first class misdemeanor charges, which could have them in jail for up to a year, which is ridiculous uh, considering that when people were charged with that, uh, the police had just issued a curfew five minutes before the curfew was supposed to be enacted. And so those who were scrambling to get home, who lived you know, far out from the city, were charged with those. So we're still trying to work and figure out a way to be able to get those expunged from people's records because it's just that it just should not be a thing. Um, third one, defund the Fredericksburg Police Department and redistrib redistribute funds in ways that benefit the community rather than police it. Um, I think that kind of explains itself. When people hear defund, defund police, they think we're trying to just like outright get rid of them. But we still know the importance of, you know, police presence in the community. Like they're here to protect and serve us. Yes, there has been a lot of issues of police brutality. We still face it. And sometimes police just end up not helping us out. Um, but uh, with defunding, the, the point is to take some of the money that they have for, you know, being like, you know, having like militarized vehicles or weapons or armor and stuff like that for such a small area of Fredericksburg. It's to move those more to things like the public schools or just things within like the community. The fourth uh, point is reduce the rates at which police are deployed at first responders to scene. So that's, you know, training 911 dispatchers to assess, assess whether or not uh, police officers need to be sent to the scene of a nonviolent or domestic disturbance. For the fifth one, uh, proactively reconfigure Fredericksburg City public schools roles in the school to prison pipeline. And if you don't know what the school to prison pipeline is, it's, um, it, it seems like kids of color, um, they go through, um, sorry, I'm kind of losing my, my words. They go through a, it's a, it's a thing with the system where kids of color are more, are harshly punished for somewhat minor things. And so there's, you know, things like uh, out of school suspension, in school suspension, um, with that kind of 
action given to them, they're more likely to start falling out of school and going into more criminal activity without, um, you know, the correct resources to keep them on the right path. And so what we want to do with that is trying to eliminate that as best as possible by having those resources and those out of school um, programs or in school programs that can help keep kids on the right track. And then the sixth point is implement anti-racist practice within the Fredericksburg City uh, public school system. And that pretty much goes with the fifth point. And then the seventh and last point is commit to having a conversation around slavery in Fredericksburg and providing reparations to those directly affected or alternatively a scholarship in honor of enslaved people. So those are the demands that were written by the Fredericksburg Power Collective that we've all come together and have embraced. And it's online. Um, the city council has um, gotten, uh, gotten those hard copies of that. And we are currently working with the city council and the city government as well um, to get those demands um, into fruition. And uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say about that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity of um, being able to uh, speak out about my uh, uh, experiences and with the protests and stuff like that. Well, we appreciate it very much, Cam. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Cam. Thank you, Justin, uh, Gay, and Craig. Uh, this has been really, really terrific. I know we've, we've used up an entire hour. I think that's perfectly fine because uh, you all had really important things to share, and I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to hear all of that. Um, we are going to move to a Q&A, and I know this is going to uh, take us a little longer than what, what some of you may have planned, but we, we'd like to devote about a half hour here to asking a few questions of the panelists, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap it up about 5.30. Uh, but I, I'm going to ask the first question, try to get as many in here as we can, and I think this is a good one uh, to send to, to Dr. Vasey uh, first. Uh, the question is this, do you think that racism is a bigger issue in the United States compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, I'm inclined to say so, because um, it's from the beginning. I mean, the country was founded, uh, the, the country incorporated racist practices into the very foundation of, uh, you know, of, of its government. Uh, it, uh, and has never, you know, has only very reluctantly <laughs> given up uh, that the allegiance to that, uh, as we've seen, you know, across the, the Civil War, the, the Jim Crow, the, the uh, Jim Crow movement and so forth. So I, I think it is. I mean, I don't think it's peculiar to America, but the American racism in America is perhaps more deeply ingrained than it is in, um, in other countries, because it's, it's there from the beginning of, of our country and from before the beginning of our country. And so Gay you. wants to comment on that. Unmute yourself, Gay. Myself. I wish I could do that in life. Um, just right quick, I think there's no other country in the world that has the same kind of history as America. And what we have to remember, and it's so important, is that our language was stolen. Our families were destroyed. <laughs> our culture was destroyed. And in places where you even had imperialism, it wasn't that kind of... Uh, uh, situation going on and that's the abbreviated answer that's excellent thank you and uh gay actually we have the next question for you and this uh is something that a number of people pointed to some of the historic differences and comparisons between previous protests and the current protests and we think about the civil rights movement and protests occurring in the 60s martin luther mm -hmm. king uh, james farmer and others compared to the current protests do you think that these protests will lead to new changes in ways that past protests were not able to? Well, to start with, one thing that's going to be interesting is that a lot of uh, uh, women leaders are emerging. Back during Dr. King's day, every protest, every sit-in, everywhere was basically organized by women, but it was just uh, male preachers basically who stood up and got the credit of leadership. And, and I wish so much Michelle Obama would run right now uh, for president. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's different uh, because while these folks are fearing the cops, I don't think they're going to do a whole lot because you got a lot of white people participating with them. 
uh, back when the sit-ins were happening, there were dogs, vicious dogs. There were water hoses. And uh, you worry about the Second Amendment people now. Well, basically, everybody white around you was a Second Amendment person in the South. So there was a, a, a deeper kind of fear. And I think we were fueled by music. And, and we probably would have it right now, but we had to have mass meetings, which, uh, which these folks can't have right now due to the pandemic. You can't just rent a James Monroe Auditorium and have a mass meeting. So uh, there are many, many differences. And I talked about that uh, last week on my, week before last too, on my front porch show. I do that Saturday afternoons. Thank you. And again, these are, these are abbreviated answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to combine a, a couple of questions together here. I'm gonna send this one to Justin. Um, as an ally, I'm often unsure how to show my support for Black Lives Matter and to say or do the right thing to show support. And so the, the question really is, uh, what's your advice? And maybe a related is uh, how someone who is not Black can become better educated about uh, BLM and the Black experience. So I think there are a plethora of different ways a person can educate themselves, can become better understanding. I think the, the first way is to start to get connected to things that are different than, than what you're used to. Um, at the University of Mary Washington, for example, I think that the James Foreman Multicultural Center does is a great outlet for providing um, a number of resources and programs that just speak to the, the means of different identities. And so first place as a student or someone on campus is getting involved and in going to those, those, those meetings. A lot of times you'll either meet, um, hear, hear a great talk or have the opportunity to engage with someone um, in discussion. You know, a lot of times on, on matters as it relates to um, people and our, their identities. Um, another way, and, and I'm speaking for myself, is, is reading. I think there's so many resources available. And, and I say that because I love to read. Um, and I, I'd be happy to give people authors. For example, my, my favorite author at the time, her name is Ibu Zaboy. Um, and she writes a lot about from the, the Black experience, um, but in a fictional, fictional way. I'm just finished reading a book of hers called um, My Life is an Ice Cream Sandwich. And so uh, using these outlets and, and opportunities to, you know, educate yourself, but then bringing that to the conversation, um, you know, with someone else, you know, as, as I stated before, you know, sometimes educating someone or, or someone wanting you to educate them can be taxing, but if somebody has, you know, wants to talk about different um, experiences that they've had, that's a different, that's, that's a different conversation. And, and I'm all for that. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I can't speak for all black people, but I, but I feel the same way. So I think it's just a matter of what you start to attach yourself to. Um, it's just like if I want to work out, I, I need to get connected to a gym. Um, or, or there are resources available, so there are ways in which you can get yourself connected. Um, it's just being willing to, to do so. That's excellent, Justin. Thank you. Um, I have a few other questions that are pretty related to um, some of the current protests. And so I want to turn this one to Cam and uh, share a couple of the questions. And, and you might be able to combine parts of this and decide how you might like to answer it. Uh, one of the, the people posting in the chat identified themselves as a member of the local community and said that they applaud the maturity of, of you and others uh, involved in the protest with your constructive demands. And it was helpful to hear about some of those demands that you outlined within your presentation, Cam. Uh, they're wondering what can people in the town do to support your efforts with those demands. And then there are also related questions about what other tips or ideas you might have for other young people in the area both on campus and in the community to become involved in the protests and the movements? Um, I think with, uh, with supporting our efforts, and thank you uh, for the question, um, for with supporting our efforts, it's, uh, it's super important just to, for citizens to kind of get involved more into like how the city government um, you know, works and stuff because like they have the city council and they always have like a lot of forums where people can comment and you know, try to talk to uh, city officials about how um, thing how pe they should go about things and like they'll take things into consideration and stuff like that. 
Um, and for people that are like wanting to get involved with uh, the protests and stuff, especially right now with uh, COVID, um, you know, being a thing, it's uh, it's just really important to just obviously like wear your mask at all times. Uh, we always have people providing masks as well as like hand sanitizer and stuff like that. Um, there is not there's not really any room to be spaced out because usually, um, unfortunately, you know, we're usually really um, bunched together um, when marching on the streets or even the sidewalks. Um, but getting involved, if, even if you can't protest, uh, I mean, Justin has um, touched up on this. It's just, uh, you know, sharing resources and giving back, signing petitions, um, as well as just, you know, listening, honestly, it was one of the biggest things, just listening to uh, your Black friends about what is going on and, you know, they can educate you on certain things and just, you know, doing, um, just educating yourself in general with stuff like what uh, Professor Vasey um, shared with the books and the articles and the videos and stuff like that. Could I just add that people can contact, they should contact their city council members and, and express support, Ex express support for what the young people out there are talking about and pushing for and talk about the, the, the importance to Fredericksburg of moving forward on these issues. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, uh, next question, I want to send it to uh, to Craig and, and maybe Gay as well. Um, we heard earlier the concept of race is a racist concept. Um, that was a powerful statement for me. Um, it, it's problematic to suggest, though, that we can be colorblind. So, so how do we move beyond the concept of race? That is absolutely a, a, an enormous question and an, an enormous project for the culture. I mean, that has to be, I think it has to be raised as a matter of a national educational policy, you know, uh, we have to be honest about it. And uh, uh, no, no, the, one of the, the quote that uh, Justin put up uh, was saying that race is not the father of racism, it's the product of racism. That's what Kendi says too. He says the same thing, is that racist practices came first and then the justification for them came later and that's what the concept of race comes in. And uh, it, we don't even admit in our public schools the degree to which the country was founded on and, and uh, perpetuated uh, racism for hundreds of years. So we really need, I mean, the, the, biggest, the biggest issue there is education, I think, is to be honest about it and, and have it out there in public. And I think tearing down these monuments, taking down these monuments, whichever, however they're done, whether it's done through a slow process or, or more quickly and dramatically, is a remarkable development because I think that's exactly what it's saying, is that it's time to move on it's time to really put that stuff behind us. And there's a, there's meaning there's a critical mass of Americans who know that now of not just black Americans, but of white Americans too, who know that now. Um, I, I don't even know how to answer that. I know as long as y'all are white, I'm black. Um, it was colored and then Negro and then black and now African American. And if you, I don't know if you've gotten your uh, census form yet, but the second or third question on it, at the top of the page is, are you black or white? And then it gives Latino, whatever. But under white, it includes Egypt and Algerian and something else. And I looked at it and I said, well, this doesn't make sense. If you are African American, Egyptians should go under African American. So with the whole question of calling ourselves African American, we kind of dilute the whole um, labels, the whole racial labels. And I don't know, I think it's, I think it's changing because more and more black and white folks are loving each other. And, and all these little babies are coming out all mixed up and you're not going to be able to put labels on them. So uh, it's still, just like somebody said earlier, uh, Colin Powell is still black, and so is a, a Barack Obama, or however you want to call him. Uh, so pretty soon, it's just going to be overrun with blackness. Yeah, so I, I can't answer that question, really. As a mixed child, I can attest to that. Hmm? I said, as a, as a mixed kid, I can attest to that. My mom's white, my dad's black. So what do you, you check black on your farm, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought you were. I thought you were mixed up there. Yeah, yeah. You just you just as handsome as you can be. Oh, he is handsome. Oh, you. Right. That's right. 
Can uh, I speak to? Those are important questions of intersectionality too, because, and I, I think, as Adegba Lola uh, points out, then there are also questions of other concerns, such as Black women um, being, you know, subjugated in different ways, uh, and those are those are really important questions and issues. Uh, Gay, I would like to turn it back to you because we did have a question specifically asking you if you wouldn't mind speaking to um, the leadership of your parents and previous generations in Fredericksburg, including Reverend Davies, Johnny Johnson, um, mm -hmm. and the, the work that they did in the 60s and, and in other eras with protest in, in this area. Um, okay, well, uh, when I was talking about Dr. King and, and the sit-ins, uh, for example, my mom, Gladys Todd, and Mrs. Mamie Scott, who was the mother of uh, Judge John Scott, they were the two who organized the sit-ins. They figured out rides to get from Mayfield. They figured out who was sitting at what counters when. They did all the work. But then when it came time to talk, it was the men who got in the pulpit. And I think that that's changing. Um, uh, so, but my mom did that. She also started a par uh, playground for black youth in, in her camp park. She started a, a canteen for teenagers at the Old Elks Hall. Uh, she was homeschool coordinator. She worked at the M. Hamrick House. My mother spent her whole life helping young people and then getting out the vote. My mom really, really helped to elect uh, Reverend Davies to city council and then to become mayor. My father was very much involved with all kinds of fundraising projects in the town. My father could sing, he could dance, he could get people to work together to put on shows. He started Harambe 360 Degrees, and we gave black youth an outlet for their talents when desegregation first came about in Fredericksburg. The black boys were accepted at James Monroe High School because they played sports, but well, most of them did. But the black girls and the black boys who were in drama and chorus and what have you, they had no outlet, so my dad made an outlet for them. Um, so again, I'm abbreviating. Uh, I would love to spend time and talk more. There we go. Is that, a, is that a, oh, I didn't touch on Reverend Davies and Johnny Johnson. I do know that when, uh, Dr. King was uh, uh, murdered. I was not in Fredericksburg at the time, but it was thought that all kinds of uh, protests were going to break out here, all kinds of violent protests. But it was Johnny and uh, Buddy Ham, Leroy Ham, and Reverend Davies, and some others who kept the peace. And um, so Fredericksburg is a different kind of place. It really is. Yeah. Thanks for that. I, I did want to turn back to, to Justin. I know you were um, trying to chime in on the, on the last question. I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that. That it was the, the question about um, moving beyond uh, the concept of race. Yeah, I just wanted to say, and this, again, in my opinion, I feel like it's so, such a staple. I don't, I don't feel like moving beyond race will ever be a thing in, in my day and time. However, I, I say that to say, I love my race. And I think I can speak for many other black people who love being black. And so we don't want to necessarily move beyond it. We just want people to understand that we are dynamic and that we are so many more things than just what the perception is continually pushed out in the media. And so, you know, black is queer, black is, you know, skaters and, 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 and you know, atheists, and they're all different identities under the realm of being black, and there's so many different experiences, um, but it's, we often are condensed to, to be the, the, this one thing, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's like almost the label gives us a homogeneous characteristic that this is who you are. And so my ask is, you know, let's not remove black, but let's get educated on all things that are black, if, if that's the case, and, you know, and let, let's learn about, you know, different people's identities, different people's experiences, because my experience is my own, but another black individual is not the same. And so, um, and that's why, again, I go back to encouraging people to educate themselves, you know, through, through reading, through writing, through podcasts and, and other you know, avenues, because there, there's so many um, outlets out here that people who are sharing their black experience, 
and it creates a different perspective and a different understanding of who we are and the different dynamics we have. We, we are dynamic people. Right. I appreciate that very much. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Gay and Craig both, but uh, Gay, why don't you go ahead? Okay, I was looking at the top of Justin's shirt and it says black, and I don't know if the bottom <laughs> says lives matter. But um, one thing that white folks can do is that they can put on one of these kind of shirts. It takes a lot of strength to put a bumper sticker on your car that says Black Lives Matter or to wear that T-shirt. And I think that that would be a good, when you were asking what could uh, white folks do to be supportive. And I just say folks, it's easier. But to be supportive, that's one thing. You can wear it on your car or on your person. And um, there's, there's, a, there's a reward in numbers. Yeah. Craig? Uh, I just wanted to comment on, earlier when you asked me a question about this notion of race, uh, you brought up the, the word colorblind. And I'm not, I am absolutely not advocating for colorblindness. I think that's absurd. Uh, I, I think it's important to say, what, we're, what I'm talking about is that race as a concept with, that connotes biological, uh, a biological, biologically built-in essence of people, that some people have whiteness and some people have blackness built into them by their birth. That's the myth. It's not that and race is a reality now. There is such a thing as whiteness, but it's a social uh, historical reality that's come about through the racial contract as being part of the structure of, of the contemporary polity, of the contemporary political world. There is yeah. such a thing as blackness now. And again, it's because of slavery. It's because of what, ha what has happened in the history of the treatment of dark people. Uh, I'm, so I'm not advocating getting rid of, the, of race. I'm advocating getting rid of a biological understanding of race. And, um, and I think one gesture one can make is to use more and more words like brown and tan and beige rather than white and black, just because it, it disrupts the way people think. And it makes them, it might make them pause and think, well, yeah, I'm not actually white, am I? You know, I'm actually kind of like a peach, or <laughs> kind of like a, <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I want to um, I want to build on the the previous topic that we were talking about, and I, I'd really like to hear what Gay has to say about this. We we all know folks who really don't understand the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we we hear it when when people respond with "All Lives Matter," for example. And and I wonder. I, I don't want to paint any broad brushstrokes about the kind of folks who who don't understand, but, but when, you do, when you do run into people who clearly don't understand what it's all about, what is, the, what is the polite way to respond to that? What do you say to those folks to get them to understand what the movement is about? Well, it's, it's so unfortunate because usually when somebody says that to you, it's really a liberal white person that says that to you. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, well, I think the, that the going imagery is that yeah, everybody has a right to a house and everybody wants a nice house and everybody wants to be their home to be protected. But right now only one house is on fire. And I think that imagery holds, um, you know, you, you can't put a fire hose on all the houses just because they're houses. You have to put out that one that's on fire. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the simple answer. That's great. That's really helpful because that dialogue is incredibly important. Uh, mm -hmm. and part of this is about educating ourselves and helping to educate others. Um, I wanted to shift the discussion a little bit because we received a number of questions um, related to defunding, you know, calls to defund the police. And I think, Cam, you spoke to this already in terms of what does that really mean? How do you deconstruct that? But um, the questions, uh, several of them were more specific to kind of the panoptic nature, the surveillance aspect of policing. Um, and both in terms of will calls to defund or demilitarize the police help prevent that uh, and help dial back some of the surveillance aspects of police and particularly in communities for people of color, but also should we be concerned about some of the new technologies that we've heard that are being used to target protesters? Um, how can we best advocate for protecting our rights, both for you know, communities of color, for protesters? Um, how do those intersect? Um, I think it really just kind of depends, uh, unfortunately, on the city, like for Fredericksburg, um, or actually, let me think about a bigger city, actually. Um, if you demilitarize the police there, um, I still believe that they will have a, um, a huge surveillance um, presence in, uh, in the city. And um, I know for a fact, I forget what they're called, but there are drones that 
at least I've seen the Fredericksburg police use, and I've, I think I've seen them in Richmond too when I was in Richmond for some protests. And what they're what they do is these uh, drones kind of like tap into or bounce off the uh, cell phone tower signals, and they obtain they can obtain data from your phone, and that's how they have been identifying um, protesters and you know people have been getting in trouble. But I think the real danger, or I think the uh, the real use of it is if people are having like dangerous rhetoric online like if they're talking about oh like I'm gonna go and like you know shoot up the police department or something or I'm just gonna cause havoc in a city I think those are the people that are being targeted the most although it's still just kind of dangerous and I'm not too sure they they don't even know really what the legality is um, of using those drones and I'm not sure why then they have deployed them but yeah, just in general, I think with demilitarization, unfortunately, um, it can't the the scales can't really be balanced. It's like if you take the if you take all the weapons or you know take the heavy use of armor away, then there will be a lot more surveillance because you know the police won't have all their you know uh, weapon or not all their weapons, but they wouldn't have their you know gas canisters or you know, rubber bullets and stuff to deploy on citizens if people were starting to get out of hand. And so the surveillance would probably be very high. That's good. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I think we have time for one last question. And this is really trying to tie several of them in together and open this up for anybody, of course. Um, you know, we're obviously talking about protests that um, came long before and, and preceded COVID, but they're taking place now during a time of COVID. And so there are questions that have been asked about for those people that are uh, participating in protests. Uh, Gay mentioned, of course, the difficulty of not protesting for some people uh, because of the dangers related to, to the pandemic. Um, you know, I think, Cam, you can speak to a little bit more of this about your own fears or pro fears of other protesters about protesting during a pandemic or the concerns about the spread of it happening because of the protests. But I also want to really leave this with a question of, how might these protests look different if they weren't being held in the middle of, of the COVID pandemic, of, aside from maybe more people perhaps being involved, maybe without having masks? Is there something else about the characteristic of being in this time and space and in the middle of COVID that has changed the nature of the protests? Um, honestly, in my opinion, I think it's kind of unfortunate to say this, but I think that uh, people like, you know, you've noticed that a lot more people are now posting on social media about this sort of stuff. And I think it's really because uh, with quarantine, like being a thing, um, you know, months prior and stuff, uh, people are now actually just like not just kind of like strong past and, uh, you know, just kind of like batting a blind eye to it. People are actually starting to like look and see what we've been, you know, trying to say for so many years and now it's just finally starting to click with people um and i think that uh with that um with going with talking about um the protests now like in this you know age of covid and stuff um it's crazy because i, I still i still believe that um yeah as you've seen on the news people you know it, covid is you know something super dangerous um for everybody but you know we've been fighting for so long that now it's you know a thing of just like it's almost like COVID has taken the backseat not to like you know make it seem like oh it's nothing anymore because it's very much a thing but people are just fearless now because I think Gay like kind of said this earlier with how it's just like there it's just a bigger thing that's going on and it's something that we like people of color black kids brown kids we go through this daily and whereas like this pandemic like yes it's occurring right now but it can be solved i mean racism well i wouldn't even go into that but um we've just been fighting for so long and so i think that people are just kind of fed up and they're over it please Kate, go ahead yeah um another thing that 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 my generation and my friends have been af afraid of we all knew that the first line of defense or the first line of the police resistance is tear gas or what's the other one? Uh, pepper spray. Pepper spray or tear gas. And both of those compromise your respiratory system. So for the pandemic, we didn't come out there. Had the pandemic not been going on, there would have been at least 
a third more people. I could not march, but I would have been there. I would have been there when they gathered. I would have been there when they ended. I would have been there. And most of the people I know would have been there. Uh, and let me just say to Cam, um, it might be a good thing that you guys tasted the tear gas because now you know that I don't care how right you are, your righteousness doesn't make um, the cops off limits. So it will just reinforce your need to be determined and your need to be strong and your need to be aware. Of course. Yeah, um, I'd say Sunday was the first time I got tear gassed, which was, you know, I, I had my mask on, but the chemicals from the, uh, from the gas was getting stuck in my mask. And so I actually had to take off my mask because it was almost, it was choking me. And I witnessed people like have asthma attacks and people were starting to have seizures because the effects were just, you know, just messing up their respiratory system and they, their body just started going into a shutdown. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people, um, you know, coughing up blood and stuff and just like choking on, you know, their own air. Like it, it's just insane. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much. A powerful and important message today. Um, this was really terrific. Really appreciate you all being here. Craig Vasey, Gaya Degbalola, Cam Coates, Justin Wilkes, thank you all for joining us today. It's really been a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, thank you everybody uh, on the webinar today for joining us. Uh, tomorrow our course continues with uh, Visual Arts and Plagues, Responses from Early Modern Italy, Museums, and Zen Buddhism. Next week, we're going to hear from our chair of the Department of English and Linguistics, as well as some chemists about other aspects of COVID-19 and how it's affected society. Uh, we appreciate everything uh, that, we, that we saw and listened to uh, here today. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Uh, if you're interested in joining the course, again, I put my email in the chat and I welcome um, your participation. Just send me a quick note and we'll sign you up. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful right, thank session. You. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Thanks, everybody. And I look forward to seeing the concert on June 20th. Uh, is that at 8 o'clock on Facebook? Excellent. Thanks again, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good night.